we've been asked to talk about democratic trends in Africa. And I thought to get us started, I'd like to give some historical context to this discussion. You know, in the decades leading up to the creation of the African Union, uh, it was a time of great turmoil for the continent. Between 1960 and 2000, there were over 82 coups on the continent. The majority of governments were led by single parties. There were many conflicts. In fact, 18 different countries were in conflict uh, in the early 1990s. And these governance factors contributed to what are called the lost decades of between 1980 and 2000 where per capita economic growth on the continent was basically flat. And it was with this background in mind that the Constitutive Act of the African Union in 2000 highlighted three primary objectives when it was established. The first was to promote peace, security, and stability. Second was to promote broad-based development. And third was to promote democratic principles and institutions, popular participation, and good governance. And the focus on governance should not be surprising because governance is the model that any society uses to make decisions. It's the manner in which interests are considered. Um, it's the basis on which resources are allocated. So it's obviously very central to our interest in security and development. You know, these three priorities dovetail actually very closely with the uh, metaphorical three-legged stool that Nobel Peace Laureate uh, uh, Wangari Mathai often cited. You could put up the slide, a picture of, of the stool. And uh, Professor Mathai, who was Africa's first female um, uh, Nobel Peace Laureate, um, said that the three, that the three legs of the stool represent three essential components of a stable society. First is sustainable development, and she always emphasized you know, a sustainable uh, in, environment, managing you know, your resources sustainably. Second is democratic governance. And third was a culture of peace. She said, without all three of those legs, um, we will never develop on the continent. And she would go on to say that most conflict in Africa, of course, is internal. And it's mostly about resources, competition for resources, and the inability to um, find ways to share power in a way that those resources can be managed equitably. Building on the recognition of the importance of these linkages, the African Union went on to adopt the Africa, African Charter of Democracy, Elections, and Good Governance in 2007. This set out various priorities and principles of democratic governance in Africa. <clears throat> the Africa Charter became a binding legal document in 2012 after 15 countries had ratified the Charter. Today, um, 38 countries on the continent have ratified the Charter, and 46 countries have signed it. In other words, the, the Democracy Charter is a formal and broadly supported articulation of Africa's governance aspirations. And the Charter draws on different traditional African values of governance, like popular participation in decision-making, consensus-seeking, 
commitment to the common good of the community, and leaders who rule with the consent and in, in accordance with the will of the population. And these are all values coming out of many African uh, village community you know, governance structures. You know, these um, qualities, these African uh, uh, values demonstrate the strong African roots of democracy on the continent. They also highlight that there's no one single version of democracy. It's not a uniform governance model. It's adapted in every country context, though it's usually characterized by three common features. The first is that there are free, fair, and regular elections, meaning that, elector, uh, that leaders are, are selected through popular participation. The second is that there uh, are freedoms to participate politically, freedom of expression, press, assembly. And so it means that there's an opportunity for citizen voice before, during, and after elections. And third, there are checks and balances on executive authority. In other words, there are shared mechanisms of power and accountability of citizens. Um, and these are ways that they can hold leaders accountable to uphold the Constitution and the rule of law. So beyond their intrinsic appeal, we see through the historical track record that democracies in Africa have actually done a relatively better job in delivering development and security. Since 2000, and using the Freedom House categorization of, of governments between free, partly free, and not free countries, we see that economic growth in democracies in Africa has been about a third faster than uh, the median on the continent. On development indicators, there are a whole host of measures, uh, including uh, infant mortality rates that are 40% better, foreign direct investment that's a third higher, and life expectancy that's nine years longer in Africa's democracies compared to the autocracies. With regards to corruption, uh, the median level of, of corruption as measured by Transparency International's Corruption Perceptions Index ranks in the bottom quartile of the global rankings, about 134 out of 180 countries. Africa's democracies, meanwhile, are um, above the global median. Uh, on Transparency International's uh, index. Notably, that doesn't mean Africa's democracy don't have corruption, it's just that they're relatively better at controlling it, something we'll come back to talking about later. With regards to security, we could put up the next slide. Um, <clears throat> there's a propensity of conflict in Africa, in Africa's autocracies. In fact, of the 18 autocracies on the continent today, 56% or 10 of them are facing conflict. Meanwhile, governments that are mixed, you know, they're partly democratic, they have partly autocratic um, uh, characteristics, uh, just under a quarter are facing conflict. And in contrast, um, Africa's democracies uh, uh, are all currently not facing any conflict. When we look at Africa's military governments, historically, we see that they have a particularly abysmal track record. Their economic growth is three percentage points slower than the median. They have higher rates of corruption, inflation, and instability. Uh, since, as we know, one coup tends to beget another coup, and there isn't any constitutional or legal means through the, uh, to, to guide the succession of power. So the bottom line is that the history 
the historical track record shows that African democracies tend to outperform autocracies. So let's take a look, re reviewing the governance trend lines uh, on the continent. If we could switch to the next slide, please. And <clears throat> as we see um, in the early 1990s, um, there were only two countries that were um, considered democracies on the continent. The vast majority were autocracies. But that shifted over the next decade, 15 years. There was a move towards multipartyism, um, an expansion of the intermediate regimes. Um, over time, nearly uh, every African government would hold elections, though, um, as we'll talk about later, not all elections are alike, and just because you have an election doesn't make you a democracy. Nonetheless, there were a growing number of democratic features that took hold on the continent. By 2011, after some ups and downs, we saw a majority of African governments that were democratic leaning. So more countries were, had democratic characteristics than those with autocratic characteristics for the, for the first time. And this shift towards more democratic governments was accompanied by a two-decade period of really unparalleled growth for the continent. Africa saw a, a, a you know, continuous positive economic growth uh, up until the pandemic. Um, again, this followed on the heels of two years of really anemic uh, per capita growth. During this time, we saw a dramatic reduction in the number of financial crises and instances of hyperinflation, and there were a drop in the number of coups. There was 58% decline in the number of coups over that next, you know, that two-decade period. Moreover, and importantly for our interests, there was a decline in the number of conflicts. I mentioned there were 18 countries in conflict in the early 1990s. Um, by 2010, that had dropped to seven. So there were many positive trends. In recent years, though, as we all know, we've seen some democratic backsliding. There have been at least six coups on the continent since 2020. Thirteen African leaders have avoided uh, term limits since 2015. Um, this follows a period between, 20, between 2000 and 2015 where there was quite a lot of progress in upholding term limits on the continent. And this is significant since some of the research we've done here at the Africa Center has shown that the average time in office for a leader who's evaded term limits in Africa is about 18 years. In contrast, for leaders who are in countries that uphold term limits, the average time in office is about four years. And we've also seen that when leaders stay in office more than two terms, the track record has been that they become progressively more repressive, corrupt, and unstable. In fact, 40% of the countries where leaders have evaded term limits are in conflict. That contrasts to just 7% for uh, countries where leaders are, are in countries where they've respected term limits. And so because of this backsliding, starting in 2019, we've actually seen a reversal now where a majority of African governments are now autocratic leaning, you know, reversing some of the progress we had seen over the previous couple of decades. And during you know, this last period, we've also seen uh, um, a dramatic in increase in the number of countries in conflict. So it's moved up from seven 
in seven countries in 2010 to 16 countries in conflict today, three quarters of which are authoritarian leaning. So the question is not really whether autocracy or democracy is better. That answer is, is clear. Democracies provide a superior governance model. The question really is how to make democracies better, how to make them more effective. And this is especially important since 75% of African citizens regularly report to Afrobarometer that they prefer democracy as a, a, over any other form of government. But these same respondents want to see improvements in their government. Um, and in particularly, they want to see those countries that are in the intermediate category become more democratic. And so to be clear, democracies do not you know, have the answers to all problems. As a country moves to democracy, it doesn't mean that everything is easy sailing. Um, democracies, like all countries, face challenges. What democracies provide are the tools by which citizens can be involved in coming to solutions. And as I said, the track record then shows that they, that they tend to generate better results. So in the question and, and answer period, we could talk more about what some of those priorities for reform and change might be. Um, but for now, let me just leave you with uh, a final image. We could switch to the slide of um, the speedboat versus the ferry boat. And when you're trying to get across from one side of the river to another, and you see the speedboat, it looks pretty attractive. It's fast, it's sleek, uh, it's going to get you there quickly. Um, the problem, though, is that speedboats are built just for a few people to get across. What's not in the picture is the vast majority of the people are actually left on the other side of the shore. In contrast, you have the ferry boat. The ferry boat is crowded. It, it looks hot. It requires a lot of compromise. People have to take into consideration others' space and, and opinions. People have to be patient. But in the end, it's the ferry boat that's getting more people across the river. And I would contend that these two images reflect the choices we have between autocracies, which are built to, to support just a few, and the ferry boat, which is meant to try and provide more services, more benefits for more people, which, is, which in the end is what democracies are all about. So thank you very much.